Hello and welcome to our Zoom education session on visual and perceptual changes in the brain. And we want to thank you for, for joining us for this discussion today. Our presentation is all about understanding visual and perceptual changes that can happen when a person has dementia. As dementia continues to progress, we often see sensory and perceptual abilities uh, that are affected. So things like Peripheral vision, depth perception, and color perception can be impacted by the brain changes that are occurring. So this presentation addresses how these changes can impact the person that's living with dementia, their ability to safely and effectively navigate their environment. And we're gonna provide some strategies to address and to adapt to these visual and perceptual changes. My name is Sarah Cook and with me today is Shelby Berry. And we are both education coordinators at the Alzheimer's Society of Peterborough, Kawartha Lakes, Northumberland, and Halliburton. And we recognize that throughout our discussion today, there may be some questions that do come up for around the topics that we're gonna talk about. Um, but just in the interest of time, and, and because I'm not always able to see the chat pod when I'm sharing my PowerPoint screen, uh, we would like to ask you if you could just hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, now, don't, you know, don't forget about the question that you want to ask, like either jot it down or you can also record it in the chat pod and Shelby and I will, will do our best to get to those questions uh, following the presentation. So thank you so much in advance for your help uh, with this today. So let's start off our discussion today by talking about vision difficulties that may occur throughout a person's life. And it could be due to changes in their eye health, but it could also come with age. And as we all know, the process of aging is acknowledged for the many changes that it can bring. And one of these significant changes can involve our sight and our perception. So with age, we may experience a, a range of vision changes, including blurring of images. So that's when we may not be able to see things as sharply as before. Uh, the need for more time to adapt to changes in light levels. So for example, when we're going from a dark room into sunlight or daylight conditions. Uh, the area in which objects are seen is getting smaller and this is known as our visual field decreasing so that can happen as well loss of peripheral vision and this has to do with our ability to see things outside of our direct line of vision problems with depth perception and that's our ability to judge the distance of or to an object and to see in three dimensions and finally, shadowing from small shapes that may float into our visual field. And this is commonly known as floaters. So it's important to know that any one of these changes can be experienced by someone who is aging. And in actual fact, many of these changes may be experienced as a, as a person continues to age. So if you're looking at that list, you may be actually checking off a few of those uh, vision difficulties. And it's not uncommon to see that with the aging process. Now, the most common eye conditions that can impact our vision and perception as we age are listed here. So cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, retinal complications from diabetes, and a condition that's called Charles Bonnet syndrome. These conditions, can all result in changes such as blurring, distortion of images, partial loss of our, of our visual field, and in some cases it can lead to blindness. So I just wanna quickly talk about these eye conditions. And so a cataract, let's start off with a cataract. So a cataract is a clouding of the normally clear lens of your eye. So for people who have cataracts, uh, seeing through cloudy lenses is a bit like looking through a frosty or a fogged up window. So it kind of gives you that feeling. Now glaucoma, it is a group of eye conditions that damage the optic nerve and the health of which is vital for good vision. This damage is often caused by an abnormally high pressure in your eye. 
And glaucoma is one of the leading causes of blindness for people over the age of 60. Macular degeneration is a degenerative condition affecting the central part of the retina, and that's called the macula. And it can result in distortion or loss of central vision. It occurs usually, and especially, I guess, in, in older adults, in which case it is often called age-related macular degeneration. Now, retinal complications from diabetes can also occur, uh, and the most common complication is called diabetic retinopathy. It's caused by damage to the blood vessels of that very light sensitive tissue at the back of the eye, which is known as the retina. And these eye conditions can also cause hallucinations to occur. And this particular condition is known as Charles Binet syndrome. And Charles Binet syndrome occurs when people whose vision has been compromised may start to see things that aren't there. So what we would know as visual hallucinations. And there's two main types of those visual hallucinations related to this condition. Um, so people may see simple repeated patterns, that can be one area. And the other area is the person may see complex images of, of either people, landscapes or objects. So it's important to know that the hallucinations are caused by the person's deteriorating sight and not from any other condition. So that's key to recognize. That's why those hallucinations are occurring. So I wanted just to show you, and I, I do apologize when we put this presentation together, um, when we imported the images, they were a little clearer. And of course, when we blow it up into the big screen, it, it does take on um, some blurriness to the images, but hopefully it helps you to understand, um, you know, the kind of the imagery that we're trying to portray today. So this slide depicts how vision can change when a person has cataracts. So on the left, you can see the image of the man with the boy that's sitting on the dock through normal vision. And then in the picture on the right, the image is significantly blurred, and that's due to the presence of cataracts on the eyes. Kind of gives you a sense of what, what it's like to see our world through the presence of cataracts. Now this slide demonstrates how vision can change when a person has glaucoma. And so again, on the left, you can see the picture of two people in kayaks through normal vision. And in the picture on the right, the outer edges of the image can't be uh, seen because of the presence or the damage that's caused from glaucoma. So again, you're losing some of that side vision. And this slide shows how vision can change when a person has macular degeneration. So on the left, you can see the image of it's two dogs that are running through a field um, through normal vision. And in the picture on the right, the image of the running dogs is almost completely hidden due to the presence of macular degeneration. So with that particular condition, as I mentioned, a person's central vision becomes lost or significantly distorted over time. So there are other conditions that may cause vision problems to occur as well. And so, for example, a stroke. A stroke can also cause someone to have problems with their vision. They may lose the ability to see things that are directly ahead of them, um, which is known as that central vision loss. Or they may lose peripheral vision, which is known as that visual field loss. This can happen in both eyes and it can happen at the same time for a person that has experienced a stroke. The person may also experience problems with eye movement and also how the brain is able to process those visual signals. Certain medications can also cause or contribute to problems with vision. And medications and drugs can, um, can include things like uh, drugs for cardiovascular problems, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, antibiotics can cause it, drugs that are used to treat Parkinson's disease, and other eye medications as well. So they can contribute to vision problems. And specific types of dementia can also damage the visual system and cause visual and perceptual difficulties. 
And that's what we're really going to concentrate our focus on today. Uh, they, you know, those specific types can include diseases like Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, dementia, Lewy body dementia, and vascular dementia. And there are rarer forms of dementia, such as a condition called posterior cortical atrophy, or what is commonly known as PCA, that can also cause visual and perceptual difficulties. And I just want to tell you a little bit about this condition. Um, PCA is a rare progressive neurodegenerative disease, and it's also a variant of Alzheimer's disease that causes damage and deterioration to the back, or what is known as the posterior region of the brain. And that area of the brain is responsible for processing what and how we see things. So PCA may affect a person's vision, their ability to read and write, their ability to fill out forms, um, as well as their ability to navigate their environment and to kind of reach out for objects. It can also cause blurred vision and problems with depth perception. Now, symptoms of PCA are most commonly seen in people in their 50s and 60s, so that's key to know, but it can also affect people until their 80s. So, if you have any other questions or would like any further information about this particular rare condition, please do let us know and we'll be sure to direct you to um, some helpful resources and information. Let's take a few minutes to talk about the brain changes that occur in dementia. And as we've discussed in other education sessions, when a person is experiencing a disease like Alzheimer's disease or some other form of dementia like vascular dementia or Lewy body dementia, the brain can experience a tremendous amount of change. And depending on the type of dementia and the areas of the brain that are being directly or indirectly impacted, by how the condition is progressing, it can cause changes in the person's cognition, in their memory, in their day-to-day -day abilities, their communication, their reasoning abilities, their level of insight, and the list goes on. So there's lots of different cognitive changes, um, memory changes, and so on. And we may not always think about how the damage to the brain also interferes with other ways that we experience our world. So, you know, our physical abilities and our perceptual abilities. The ability to see and experience our world is quite a complicated process. We often think that seeing is simply the result of the information that our eyes receive from external stimuli in our environment. Okay? But it is more than just our vision. While seeing begins with our eyes, it also involves the way that our brain perceives the information that is received through our eyes. When our brain receives the information, it not only interprets it in relation to our expectations of what will be seen, but it also interprets it in relation to our other senses, our cognitive thoughts and our memories. So it's really a culmination of all of these things working together. So we then become aware of what has been seen. In other words, our brain learns how to perceive the information that's taken in through our eyes and through our other senses as well. Have you ever felt that your eyes are playing tricks on you? Well, vision and perception are not always entirely reliable, as many of us may have experienced at some point in our lives. Potential problems can occur not only with a person's vision, but a person can also experience problems with their perception as well. So in dementia, problems can occur in the brain as a result of the impact of the disease or the disorder that's creating damage or shrinkage or atrophy in the brain. And because there's so many different stages or aspects of the seeing process, we can experience different types of mistakes or combinations of mistakes that can occur. And some of these common mistakes can include both misperceptions and misidentifications. Misperceptions occur when the person sees one particular thing as something else. 
So for example, they may mistake a coat that's hanging on a coat rack as a person that's standing there. Or they may see a black mat on the floor as a whole. Now, misidentifications can happen when there is damage to specific parts of the brain. And this damage can lead to problems in identifying specific objects and specific people. So for example, a person with dementia may, may mistake a son for a husband or a son for a brother. And that can happen quite often. Once we understand the impact of visual and perceptual problems that can happen in dementia, we become aware of how easy it is for these mistakes to lead to the person either saying or doing things that do not necessarily make sense to others. The difficulties they are experiencing, though, are not related to problems with their thinking abilities. In other words, their mistakes are not based on incorrect reasoning or what is sometimes referred to as delusional thinking. The problem is instead a result of the damage that they are experiencing to their brain and to the visual system in the brain. So, this slide shows two examples of misperception involving a coat rack. So a person with dementia may interpret these images as a person standing there instead of a coat rack with items that are hanging on it. So the shadows in the image on the right side, if you look to the picture on the right side, those shadows that are there, it actually makes the image appear more lifelike. And it could appear as though a person is lurking there. So these are examples of misperceptions. Take a look at these two images on this slide. Can you spot the difference? Give you just a moment to look at those. Look how easy it can be for a person to misperceive this image of the throw pillows and the blanket or the afghan that's draped over the chair for a woman sitting in the chair. Okay, the floor lamp it's kind of positioned over top of the chair to a person with vision and perception problems that floor lamp may look like a person's head and of course the pillows and the blanket may look like a person's body so it's very easy for that misperception to happen to a person that is experiencing visual and perceptual difficulties this image shows an example of misidentification. So the man standing at the sink in this image looks into the mirror and due to the memory loss and the perceptual problems of dementia that he is experiencing, combined with the expectation of seeing himself at a much younger age, he in turn perceives a much younger version of himself. So based on all of the information that his brain is telling him, he actually sees an, a much younger image. That's an example of misidentification. Now vision and perception primarily takes place in two areas of the brain, which we're going to explore next. It is important to understand that damage to either of these two lobes can present significant change in how a person with dementia is able to experience their world. As some of you may know, and this is a bit of a, I guess, a biology lesson, the brain has two hemispheres. So we have the left side and the right side of, of the brain. And there are several lobes of the brain that you can see here in this color image. Each differently colored area represents a specific lobe in the brain. And the area that is that burgundy red at the top of the brain, and often what I refer to as the crown of the head, that is known as the parietal lobe. We have a parietal lobe on, on both the left and the right side of our brains. And the parietal lobe is responsible for several important functions. It is known as the logic and analytic center of the brain. And while it controls the functions that are listed here on the slide, for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna focus on the areas that are related to perception and recognition. And I've highlighted those areas in yellow for you to be able to see on the slide. 
A particular interest in the parietal lobe, sorry, a particular interest is the parietal lobe's ability to process spatial information, such as knowing where we are in a specific environment and where other objects are in relation to us. So for example, the parietal lobe helps us to perceive how near or far we are to an object or a person and where the object is in relation to other objects. If there is damage though to the parietal lobe as a result of having dementia, the person's perception of this information may become significantly distorted. The other main area of the parietal lobe responsible for um, our perception of sensory information and it's our ability to recognize familiar objects in people. If this part of the brain is damaged, information that we take in through our five senses, in this case, through our vision, because that's the focus of our session today, that information is often misperceived and misunderstood. So misperception of objects, including people, can sometimes cause very fearful behaviors to occur. In this image, you can see the lobes of the brain that are highlighted in green at the very back of the brain. And this area of the brain is known as the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is our vision and depth perception control center of the brain. And this lobe controls our vision overall. And it also enables us to see and combine colors and shapes, angles and movement into meaningful patterns. So damage to the occipital lobes eventually does occur in most forms of dementia, although it does not generally occur uh, during the early stages. Damage to these lobes usually occurs a little bit later on in the disease process. But also the surrounding visual areas that allow us to put the elements of vision together can be affected, which leads to unusual perceptual difficulties such as loss of depth vision, or the inability to see movement. And a person with uh, may experience difficulty figuring out what they see in front of them if they have dementia. Loss of depth perception can have a significant impact on the person's confidence and their ability to move freely throughout their environment. It may change the way a person sits and also the way a person walks. And we're gonna talk about this more as we go through our, our session today. More severe problems with their visual perception can contribute to the occurrence of visual hallucinations, which again, we're gonna talk about a little bit later uh, in our session. With the changes in the brain that can happen in the parietal and occipital lobes, it is important to understand the impact that those visual and perceptual changes may have in three main areas. So we're gonna talk about, over the next several slides, we're gonna talk about damage to peripheral vision, to depth perception, and also to color perception. So first let's talk about the impact, um, you know, when there's loss of peripheral vision, what does that look like? Well, with loss, with a loss in peripheral vision, a person with dementia may not be able to see people or objects unless they're right in front of them. This particular vision loss is often referred to as tunnel vision. With tunnel vision, the person experiences a loss of their side vision, and this causes difficulty seeing people or objects around them. Individuals with dementia are much more vulnerable to experiencing a startle response to those that may approach them from behind or from the side. And loss of, of uh, peripheral vision can impact the person's overall orientation, how they move around and how well they can see at night. So that is significantly impacted as well. So here are two images that give us a sense of what it might feel like to have a loss of peripheral vision. The image on the left depicts the visual perspective of losing the outer edges of our central vision and also our side vision. Now the image of the long hallway on the right, that gives us a sense of what it might feel like to have a loss of peripheral vision. This picture gives us the feeling you get of walking down a very narrow hallway where the hallway itself actually feels like it's closing in on us. 
And if you want to have a physical sense of what it's like to lose peripheral vision, I encourage you to make your hands into the shape of binoculars and hold them up to your eyes. Okay, so if you do this, this allows you to have a moment to, you know, view your world when you only have central vision. So imagine you do not have that peripheral vision. So the sense that this gives you is what a person that has lost their peripheral vision, this is how they are experiencing their world. Now a loss in depth perception represents a loss of the ability to perceive distance in the visual field or to see in three dimensions. So a loss of depth perception also involves an, an inability to distinguish how far away an object or a person may be. With the change in perception, a person may experience an inability to see over, under, and around things, which also can impact their ability to navigate their environment. And of course, overall, everything in their environment appears to be flat or two-dimensional, and it blends together. So for example, it is hard for a person to distinguish where one thing stops and another thing starts. So think about a transition from a tiled surface to a carpeted surface, or where one step in a staircase starts and ends, or where a white dinner plate is on a white tablecloth. And we're gonna show you some examples of, of this. So here are some images of different sets of stairs. And the two on the top show pictures of staircases. The image on the top left gives us a sense of what it may look like to go up a set of stairs especially if that staircase has a patterned surface. You might even feel a little, a little woozy even looking at that staircase. The image on the right, it shows what it might look like to go down a set of stairs when there's little definition in the steps of the staircase. The steps just appear to all blend together. And the image on the bottom, well, that shows what it might look like to try and navigate the stairs of an escalator. Moving stairs like these are particularly difficult for persons with dementia to try to navigate. Now these images show us how different types, patterns, and colors of flooring can cause significant challenges to the person with dementia who's trying to navigate through an environment. The image on the left shows dark flooring with white walls and so to a person with dementia who has a loss of, of depth perception, that dark flooring can appear as though it's a very large void and they may avoid walking there for fear of falling through. The image on the right shows a black and white checkerboard pattern on the kitchen floor. To a person with dementia who's experiencing that loss of depth vision, the black squares can actually appear as a series of holes in the flooring. And so the person with dementia will likely avoid walking there for fear of falling into those holes. A change in color perception may also make it difficult for the person with dementia to navigate their environment. Loss of color perception represents that inability to distinguish certain shades of color. So the person may have a, a difficulty distinguishing between reds and greens, which is the most common um, difficulty, blues and yellows as well, uh, blues and purples and, and other colors like that. The color hues may actually not be as bright for that person when they're trying to perceive that color. And of course, poor lighting or shadows can make that color perception much worse. So loss of color perception can make things appear indistinct. So objects or surfaces may seem to blend together with, with that lack of color definition. And so we've got some examples of what that may look like. So this slide shows a series of images that help to depict what it may be like to have that loss of color perception. As you can see in all of these images, there's very little color definition. We often like to choose white dinner plates and white tablecloths for our dining experiences. However, 
for the person with dementia who is experiencing a loss of color perception, white colored foods on white dinner plates on top of white tables or tablecloths make the food look non-existent on the plate. And so it all blends together, making for what can be a very unfortunate dining experience for the person with dementia. If they're presented with a dinner plate and it looks like nothing is on it, they may become very withdrawn and choose not to eat. Now in the past, many hospitals and long-term care homes have gone with the look of pristine white walls, floors, and ceilings in their buildings so that everything appears streamlined and cleaned. Uh, but as you can see in the lower right image, this can make for a very difficult environment for the person with dementia to navigate. So again, the floors and the walls and the ceilings appear to all blend together and add to that the high gloss on the floors and the bright lighting at the end of the hall. It makes it very difficult for the person with dementia to see. Now, bathtubs. Bathtubs can be particularly distressing for persons with dementia. As you can see from the image on the top right corner of this slide, the clear water that's running into the white bathtub makes it look bottomless. I don't know about you, but would you want to step into something that looks bottomless? So with that question to ponder, I'm now gonna turn it over to Shelby who is gonna discuss the vision difficulties in dementia a little bit further. Thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? We can. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so now that we've had a chance to talk about the parts of the brain that are responsible for vision and perception, as well as the types of dementia that cause vision difficulties to occur, let's talk a bit more about um, the vision and perception difficulties that a person living with dementia may experience as a symptom of their dementia. So the specific difficulties a person experiences will vary um, depending on the type of dementia they have. Um, this is because each type of dementia can damage the visual system in a different way. So a person with dementia may experience a range of difficulties with their vision and perception. So let's take a look at what some of these difficulties may include. And Sarah's already given us a great overview of, of some of these of these difficulties. Um, so the person may be less sensitive to differences in contrast, such as black and white, and contrast between objects and backgrounds. So as Sarah mentioned, something that's three-dimensional to us may appear to be two-dimensional or more flat to the person with dementia. The person may also be less able to detect movement in their environment. So for example, if, there is, um, if they have a small pet or something that's moving around at their feet, or if someone's approaching them from the side or from behind, they may have a hard time being able to detect that movement. And this also ties into the next point um, that they are experiencing changes in their visual field. So as Sarah mentioned, if they kind of have that binocular vision, they're going to be less able to detect movement um, at the side or maybe behind them because they, they aren't able to see in those spaces. The person may also be less able to detect different color changes. So for example, a person may have a, a problem or difficulty telling the difference between blue or purple. So if the caregiver is asking, would you like to wear this blue shirt or this purple shirt today? It may sound like or seem like they're taking a long time to make that decision. Um, but they may more so be having difficulty discerning between the, the two colors, which is, you know, the main part of, of the question they've been asked. So some other difficulties for the person with dementia may include changes to how the pupil reacts to light. So if they're moving from one space to another where the lighting is different, so for example, um, going inside to outside where it's brighter or vice versa, um, it may take longer for their pupils to react to this change in light. 
They could also experience problems directing or changing their gaze. So for example, if the caregiver um, tells the person with dementia to look at the bird feeder because there's a, you know, a neat bird there, and the person with dementia is already um, focused on, say, reading the newspaper up close, um, they may have trouble redirecting their gaze to the bird feeder to see the bird. Um, to the caregiver, it may seem like the person with dementia is not listening, but it may more so be a problem with their information processing because their brain is slow to the process that, that they have been asked to look at something else. And so they need to make that adjustment with, with their gaze to where they're supposed to be looking. Um, as Sarah mentioned, they could also have problems with the recognition of objects, faces, and colors. And they could also lose the ability to say what has been seen. Um, so in general, if the, if the processes in the brain are kind of slowing due to dementia, the person might have a, diff, a difficult time seeing something and then in the brain having that convert into verbal language and then them verbally saying what they've seen. So that's actually quite a complicated process and because of the changes with dementia, they may have a hard time actually verbalizing what they are seeing. Uh, the person may also experience double vision, which is usually when we see two of something um, in our line of vision. And um, Sarah showed some great examples too of how they might have some difficulties with depth perception, um, which is basically judging the distance of, of an object um, in comparison to where the person is. So dementia can also cause difficulties with orientation. And orientation here um, means basically where the person is physically in their space. Um, so this can lead to uh, bumping into things in their environment. So for example, they might bump into a chair or knock things off a shelf as they move past. Um, you might also notice the person is swerving to av avoid things like door frames. So they may not be able to properly judge the positioning of their body as they walk through certain transition points like door frames. Um, this can especially be the case if the person is also um, using a walker or a wheelchair to move around. So if they're already having some difficulty judging um, where they're moving in the space with just their own body, a, a walker or wheelchair is often a bit wider than that. So, you know, they might also bump into things or swerve to avoid things if they're using um, these types of devices as well. The person may also have difficulty reaching for things such as a cup of tea on the table um, or um, getting a door handle if they're trying to open the door. So what you might sometimes see is the person might accommodate by feeling the table first as they lead up to an object. So, they're resorting to using the sense of touch to make up for that lack of depth perception, or the same might be true for kind of finding that door handle. They might move around the door um, to find that handle and use touch instead. So some other impacts on the person living with dementia that uh, you may notice as a, as a caregiver or a family member um, is the person might have difficulties with activities and hobbies, um, such as reading and writing. They could also have problems locating people or objects, um, even if they are in front of the person. So this may be because of other visual distractions, so for example, a patterned wallpaper, or because there could be a lack of contrast. Um, so as Sarah showed us with the example of the foods on the plate, you know, they might not be seeing the mashed potatoes or the poached egg on the white plate. So, uh, you know, a caregiver or family member might encourage them to finish their meal, but to them, they might already feel they're done their meal because they're not seeing the mashed potatoes that are on the white plate. The person, um, you might also notice the person misinterpreting reflections, um, such as seeing an intruder or refusing to go into the bathroom because it looks like someone else is in there. So they may not recognize that their reflection in the mirror um, is actually them. So they may think that there's someone else lurking there. So we have a good visual example of this coming up. 
You might also notice the person mistaking images on the television for real people or circumstances. So whatever's happening on TV, they think that's actually um, happening where they are. So for example, if the show includes war or fighting, they may feel that they are immersed in that actual event. So they're having a hard time discerning between um, kind of reality and what's happening on the television. The person may also have difficulty positioning themselves on a chair or on the toilet. So they may sit on the arm of the chair instead of the seat of the chair. So with the changes in the visual field, it can be kind of very uncertain and unknown for someone with dementia to go backwards. Um, so sometimes you might see someone accommodate by backing up and waiting till the back of their leg hits a chair before they sit down, or they may approach it from the front and then kind of turn sideways to sit. Um, and, and in those cases, they might end up sitting on the arm of the chair or kind of look uncomfortable, but it's the best and safest way for them to, to seat themselves down. They might also become confused or restless because the environment is visually overstimulating and difficult to navigate. So for example, if the room um, has patterned wallpaper, a busy carpet, bright lights or too many signs, um, that might be a lot for the person's brain to process. And with that so much stimuli um, for it to process at once, it could be quite overwhelming for them. So next we have a few visual examples of some of the things that we just spoke about. So um, in terms of misinterpreting reflections, as this image shows, a person with dementia may think they are much younger in age when they look into the mirror. And so they're surprised to see an older person staring back at them. So as some forms of dementia progress, the person with, dem with dementia may not think it's the year 2020, for example, and they may believe they are younger and living in an earlier decade of their life. So therefore, they are surprised to see an older person looking back at them um, when they're looking in any of the mirrors of their house. So they may think this person is an intruder or someone that follows them around because they don't recognize um, that they are much older than their perception of themselves. Um, although this uh, picture looks like a lovely Christmas scene, um, it's actually the perfect example of how busy and overstimulating environments can be difficult and distressing for the person with dementia. So in this case, the bright lights, the busy Christmas decor, um, the reflection of the Christmas lights on the glossy floor and likely in the windows as well, the busy area rugs, the wreath around the chandelier, and other Christmas decorations that can be found all through the room can appear overwhelming um, to the person with dementia. Um, and also taking into consideration that, you know, the person is probably meeting with family in this room as well. So we haven't even added in the people yet, or I'm not sure if there's presents under the tree yet either, but you know, there, there's a lot going on in this space. So it could be hard for, for a person living with dementia. And then this slide shows um, some busy carpet patterns. So take a look at these carpet images. Um, can you see anything within the carpet patterns? I'll give you a, a second there. So we may see a face or an object or an animal. So when Sarah and I were actually putting this presentation together, it kind of became a bit of a, a game of I spy. So um, I noticed an animal face, then Sarah noticed ears or eyes of what could be an owl or a bird shape. And then I noticed the part that I thought looked a bit like a fire breathing dragon. So um, with this in mind, we have to imagine how distressing or overstimulating busy carpet patterns can be for the person with dementia who's experiencing not only perceptual difficulties, but they may have a hard time discerning between what's real and what's not real on top of that. So visual and perceptual difficulties can also lead to problems moving around and navigating the environment. 
So as a result of these difficulties, people with dementia may experience difficulties in these areas. So they may misjudge distances and the location of certain objects, um, even if these objects are in familiar environments. They may step too highly over carpet transitions on the floor or over shadows because the change in color looks like a change in level or height for them. And we have a good visual example of this coming up. Um, they may also have difficulty going downstairs due to problems judging um, how many steps there are and the distance between steps. So sh Sarah showed us some great examples of those. And they may try to avoid shiny floors and surfaces because they appear wet or slippery. So these problems can make a person afraid of falling and may cause them to slow down their movements while they try to walk safely through that space. So this slide has some examples of, of what we were just talking about. So the two images at the top of the slides show how the physical space may present barriers to the person moving about freely. So the reflection of the kitchen window on the shiny floor, which is the top um, left photo, may be quite confusing and unsettling for the person with dementia. So as you can see, the floor has quite a high gloss finish on it. So for the person with dementia, they, this might look quite slippery to them and they might have a fear of falling or slipping. Um, in addition, the high gloss also makes the reflection of the window quite prominent in the flooring and the person might not know exactly what that is. So again, they might try to walk around it or in general, they may find this, this space to be too overwhelming and might avoid it in general. Um, in the second photo on the top right, you can see um, the shadows being cast over uh, the hardwood floors. Um, so for this, this could be a, uh, confusing for the person with dementia because they may not understand that the pattern on the floor is caused by these shadows and they may try to step over the shadowed areas or avoid entering into the space altogether. So these shadows could actually appear like maybe a crack in the floor or something like that and, and they might want to avoid it, especially because it looks like there's so many of them in that space. The two images at the bottom of the slideshow uh, how difficult it can be for the person with dementia to judge the, dif dif the distance of objects in their surroundings, or in other words, how close or within reach the object is to them. So in the photo on the bottom left, you can see that a caregiver is passing the person with dementia some um, tea on a saucer and they're making sure that they have a good hold on, on that. Um, the image on the bottom right shows what can happen if we set that tea on the table for the person and there is always the possibility that they might spill that if they're having some difficulties with that depth perception perception and judging how far away it is. So they might accidentally bump into the table um, and spill the tea or um, you can notice that the tea is on the, everything's white, you know, the, the cup, the saucer and the table. So they might misjudge putting the tea onto the white saucer, which could lead to a spill as well. So it all blends together when depth and color perception are both being compromised. So here are some tips and strategies for supporting a person with dementia with their movement and orientation. So we want to try to anticipate the situation and explain the environment to the person. So for example, if you notice someone avoiding a room with a shiny floor or surface, walk in first to show the person that it is safe. If they are reluctant to enter their darkened bedroom, walk into the room and turn on the lights and explain that you're going to make sure that there's enough light for the person to feel comfortable moving about in there. Um, continue to offer, offer the person plenty of support and encouragement. This is really reassuring for them. And try not to make the person feel rushed and allow plenty of time. Um, this will help them to feel more comfortable in their environment. And in addition, slow down your move, our, our own movements. Um, this will help them to follow along in a safe manner and for them to feel that we are not rushing them. So 
if we want to think of an example that might put ourselves into a person with dementia shoes and what their experience might be like, um, if we think about the winter time, um, if we are walking down a sl our sloped icy driveway to put the garbage out on the curb, um, we are careful and often slow things down to assess what we see. You know, is there ice? How much snow fell and how far down is my foot going to sink? Is there ice under that snow? Um, so there are all of these different things to consider and we often adjust our footing when we're doing this. We slow down, we take smaller steps, um, things like this. So similarly, for a person with dementia, these may be the types of precautions they are taking when they're moving through what appears to be a normal environment to us. So we wanna keep you know, this example in mind um, when we slow things down for them. And we also can't forget about other visual considerations for the person living with dementia. It is important to take into account the following questions to help um, ensure the person with dementia is seeing as well as possible. So does the person with dementia have prescription eyeglasses and are they the right prescriptions? We want to make sure that this is up to date. Are their eyeglasses clean? If they're not cleaned often, they can kind of become cloudy and have like a residue or even spots if they've been out in, in bad weather. Um, are they easily accessible and are they left in plain view? So, you know, I'm sure we all know glasses can go missing. Um, so it can be helpful sometimes to make sure they're accessible. Maybe they have a glasses chain around their neck so that they're always there. Um, and it can also be helpful to have an extra pair. So if they're kind of the cheap um, uh, cheater glasses, we can buy multiple ones. Or it's often helpful to keep old glasses as a backup in case the other glasses um, go missing until we can replace them. And we always want to consider what other visual impairments the person could have. And if we feel that um, there's something that needs to be checked on, we can make an appointment with their eye care professional. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah and she's going to um, just do an overview of delusions and hallucinations in dementia before we wrap up the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Shelby. So delusions and hallucinations, they can often be symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And in some specific forms of dementia, hallucinations are much more common. And they can include things like Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia. With delusions and hallucinations, people do not experience things as they really are. And so let's discuss why delusions and hallucinations happen in dementia and explore some tips for coping with them. Hallucinations are really incorrect perceptions of objects or events involving the senses. So in other words, they're an experience of something that is not really there. They seem real to the person that is experiencing them, but they can't be verified by anyone else. Hallucinations are a false perception that can result in either positive or also negative experiences. And hallucinations that are experienced by people with dementia can involve any of the senses, but they're most often either visual, so seeing something that really isn't there, or auditory, hearing noises or voices that do not actually exist. And sometimes hallucinations can involve smelling, tasting or feeling things that do not really exist, but these do tend to occur less frequently than the visual and auditory hallucinations. So an example of a visual hallucination could be seeing bugs crawling over the bed or on the wall that really aren't there. Of course, as we already mentioned earlier, people can make those visual mistakes sometimes, you know, mistaking that house coat hanging up for a person standing there. Um, because it's, it's more about they, they just can't see that object clearly. So this can happen to anyone and that's not considered a hallucination. So we're just giving a bit of a, a comparison there. But it is important to review some of the possible causes of hallucinations. So 
different combinations of medications can sometimes cause hallucinations to happen. And so if that's the case, if you do suspect that it is medication related, you may wish to speak to a doctor about this. Because in, in some cases, they do find that it's, it's um, medications that are interacting with, with each other that cause hallucinations. It could also be a result of unfamiliar people and environments that cause people to hallucinate. Changes in their routine, as simple as, as a concept as that can seem, um, changes in routine can really impact. And yeah, it can certainly lead to hallucinations occurring. Inadequate lighting or an overstimulation in their environment. So as, as Shelby mentioned, you know, those overstimulating environments where there's too much noise, too many people, too many distractions, that busy, busy world um, can certainly lead to uh, hallucinations. And so can late day restlessness or what is often referred to as sundowning, um, that condition of sundowning. And, and it's a form of disorientation and confusion that some people with dementia may experience in the, in the late afternoon hours. So um, all of those things can be possible causes and really we need to, to address um, those conditions. Now delusions are a little bit different. Um, and sometimes they, they get mixed up a little bit uh, when people are trying to define what, what delusions are. So delusions are false beliefs. And despite our best attempts to reason or to provide evidence, you know, about something to the person with dementia that is experiencing those delusions, that person will not be able to change their belief. So for example, a person with dementia may have a delusion where they believe that someone else is living in their home when the person actually lives alone. Delusions can also be experienced in the form of paranoid beliefs or in accusing others uh, for things that have not happened. So for example, the person with dementia may misplace an item and they may blame others for stealing it. Or we've also had the situation happen that if the care partner leaves to attend an appointment outside of the home, the person with dementia may accuse them of having an affair. And some people with dementia may have the delusion that others are out to get them. So, you know, they may believe that their food is being poisoned, for example, or that harm is being inflicted on them in some, in some way, shape or form. Hallucin sorry, hallucinations and delusions can be particularly distressing, not only for the person that's living with dementia, but also for caregivers and family members that are supporting the person. And so we wanted to share with you some suggestions for responding to hallucinations and delusions when they do happen. So first of all, we want to try to determine if the person is experiencing any difficulty with their hearing or their vision. You know, sometimes they have auditory hallucinations because they have ringing or tinnitus in their ears and we want to investigate, could that be um, a reason for those hallucinations? Again, same with the, the vision uh, changes. It may be leading to those hallucinations. We also want to make sure that the lighting in their space is adequate and their room is well lit. So again, it eliminates the shadows and enhances uh, that overall ability to see their environment and to feel safe in it. We need to make sure that the person is also eating a well-balanced diet because research has shown that malnutrition or sometimes even dehydration can result in that undernourishment of the brain which can cause the hallucinations and delusions to happen. So, making sure that that person is receiving the proper uh, hydration and, and vital vi uh, vitamins and nutrients for their brain health. Try to make the environment as comfortable as possible for the individual. You know, unfamiliar people or environments can be very disruptive and stressful for the person with dementia. So we may see more hallucinations and delusions happening as a result. So try to make that environment comfortable. Keep routines and schedules as consistent as possible uh, because as I mentioned before, you know, that interruption in routine can, can cause it to happen. Try not to change the person's environment. Try to keep it safe and familiar for them. So this may not be the best time to decide that you want to do a little interior design uh, change up. It can be very 
uh, distressing to the person. And also check for signs of physical injuries like bruises or scrapes because a fall that may not have been witnessed by anyone could be the cause of a person's hallucination. So do check and make sure that they have not uh, fallen victim to you know, a serious injury that has impacted their brain health. Some other strategies, um, determine whether the hallucination or the delusion is bothering the person with dementia. Sometimes those hallucinations can be quite pleasant, so you may not need to address it with them. They may enjoy, you know, if they're seeing um, chicks out playing on the lawn or they hear children nearby, uh, if it's an auditory hallucin hallucination, you may not need to address it. Trying to find a way to alleviate any possible distress if, if the hallucination is causing distress. So for example, if the person with dementia says that her necklace has been stolen, you know, help her, help her look for it or distract her with another meaningful activity so that she's not focused on the distress that accompanies that feeling of loss. Respond to the feelings and not necessarily to the issue. So Try not to contradict the person and tell them that the hallucination or the delusion is not real. Instead, try to acknowledge their concern and their emotions. You know, if they feel that that necklace has been stolen, you can say, well, I understand. If you feel that your necklace has been stolen, I understand why you're feeling so upset. So acknowledging and validating. Do not get angry with the person. You know, and avoid arguing with them. You will never win an argument with a person who is having a hallucination or a delusion because you need to remember that hallucinations and delusions are very real to the person. So just because we're not, not experiencing those uh, hallucinations or delusions does not mean that the person is not. It's very, very real to them. We also need to investigate possible suspicions that that could be based on facts. And it's possible that the person really could be a victim. And I've, I've heard stories over the years and in working in a, uh, with staff in a variety of, of settings where you know, they have followed up on those suspicions. And unfortunately, it has been proven that the person is right. So we just have to be careful because unfortunately, people do often take advantage of individuals that have dementia because they see them as vulnerable. They see them as having memory loss. Um, and it, it happens, so we need to make sure that we follow up on that. Use familiar distractions like listening to music or exercise, getting out for a walk, or playing cards, looking at photos together, some, some things that may be meaningful distractions to the person. And offering that gentle reassurance um, you know, that's really important if the person is experiencing uh, fear or anxiety over that hallucination or delusion. We want to make sure that we're offering that reassuring um, and understanding environment. So, we did talk about a lot of information today. Um, you know, when we're looking at visual and perceptual changes in dementia there, there's several, um, you know, factors to consider in it. And it, you know, people with dementia often face visual changes as we talked about related to aging. And then on top of that, they have the brain changes that may cause misperceptions. So it can be difficult, you know, to, to try to figure out exactly where that vision problem is or that misperception is occurring. And it's often an overlap of those things. So we want to remind you that you know this can be a very difficult topic uh, for many people if they if they're the person with dementia that they're caring for is experiencing um, the changes in, in their visual field or hallucinations or delusions, and we want to make sure that you know that you're not alone and that we are here to help you uh, with any information or any strategies that may be helpful. Um, certainly, what we've talked about today is not an endless list. There's there's been lots of uh, helpful resources that have been designed to support caregivers and family members and also uh, for the person with dementia themselves. So uh, please, you know, reach out to your client support coordinator if you have any questions um, or you can always reach out to both Shelby and myself, you know, if you have uh, a need for, for some great information or some helpful 
um, tools to assist you. We're always there for you and our information is here. So our resource, I just wanted to point out, there are some of the resources that we used uh, for today's presentation, but by, you know, that by no means is this an endless list. We wanna be sure that uh, we point you in the right direction of, of whatever you might need. So with that being said, I'm gonna stop sharing my, my screen and look out to all of you to see if you have any questions or comments uh, about our topic today. I do know it was a, a fairly meaty one. Are there any, any comments or questions for Shelby or myself? I thought it was great. I th it was so informative. Um, but I, have, I do have a question. My husband has aphasia. And I don't know whether that is something separate from a visual thing because he does uh, have problems with words, right? His, all the verbal skills, um, his reading ability, writing speaking so um I, i'm not sure is that something that's absolutely separate from this visual oh nancy that's such a great question and what you're mentioning aphasia you know it's we often see all of these brain changes overlapping and connecting you know that's one thing can lead to the other and and uh, we want to let you know that coming up, we've actually, um, in the fall, we're going to be uh, hosting an education session on what we call the A's of dementia. The key, you know, changes that happen in the brain that affect one of them, one of them is aphasia. And so aphasia really, aphasia is really about that loss of communication the speech and the comprehension. So they can lose that ability to understand written words, right? They're, you know, that the verbal and visual um, memory starts to be impacted as dementia right. continues to change the brain. But what you're saying definitely overlaps. You know? okay. Um, okay. So if you would like with coming up with, with the education, I, I'm hopeful that um, the education that will will do on the A's will really kind of open your eyes to a lot right. of, of those changes. Whenever we talk about the A's, you know, it's one of those presentations that people say, oh my gosh, like the light bulb moments. I, I right. understand why, you know, the person is acting a different way now. I understand why they're not able to recognize that language. So yeah. Shelby and I just over the last several sessions, you know, when we've been talking about different behaviors and different brain changes, we both agreed that having a, a session on the A's would be very helpful because so many things are related to them. Okay, that's wonderful. Yes. That's great to yes. hear. Yeah. And in the meantime, Nancy, if you if you would like, there's great there's some great resources on aphasia that we'd be happy to send you if you just want to send us an email. Um, we can make okay. sure those. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for your question too. That was a great one. Any other questions or comments about today's information? I have one, Sarah. Sure. I have one. Um, you were talking about all these different uh, vision problems that uh, happen when your loved one has dementia. Well, like, how would you know? My husband's at a stage now where he's hardly talking, and I can't get in to see him. And how would you know he has ha, has any of these problems? I, Diane, I know that is, he has deception, and I know he has the peripheral problems. But I, I mean, as far as cataracts go, or the other, like how do you know? Yeah. No, Diane, you that is such a great question that you raise, and and it does it gets more difficult as as people continue to progress through dementia, right? their ability to have vision tests, for example, may not be accurate. Um, we've often heard clients say that if they go to the eye doctor, I mean, sometimes they're able, eye doctors are able to see the damage on the lens or the retina, they're able to see those, uh, those changes, those physical changes, but often 
their assessment of the person relies on the person's ability to tell them how well they're seeing. And if they're not able to do that, you may not get an accurate um, assessment of how well they're seeing or where those vision problems lie. So that, that happened was the last time Brian met. He wasn't able to, you know, read the letters or to answer the questions. I more or less have to do it on his behalf. You know, so it's, we don't even do that now because it's just difficult. Absolutely. And now because we've got the pandemic, he can't go out. So. Yeah. No, Diane, you're so right. And, and that's, it's a tricky thing because as you can imagine, right? Cataracts, other eye conditions like glaucoma and macular degeneration, they occur over time. Well, so does dementia and the brain changes that that continue to happen there with perception. So it's very difficult sometimes to figure out what is the root cause. But what we do know, you know, it's it's kind of that overarching um, kind of approach is that we always want to try to enhance their vision and their hearing as much as possible so that it makes their world a, a little easier to navigate. So, you know, if we can detect that there's a hearing difficulty, and we want to make sure that they can hear through a hearing aid, you know, or that, that like what Shelby was talking about, that if they do need glasses, well, we may not be able to judge appropriately if that prescription is perfect for what they need. But if we can make sure that those glasses are clean and that they do have them, at least it's one more aid to help them navigate that environment. It, it's so tricky, though. Um, and and we do find that we've worked, sorry, we've worked with lots of, of uh, frontline care providers that say that. I've worked with um, denturists, for example, and they're trying to find out if they've got the right fit. You know, that person is comfortable and the person with dementia may not be able to respond uh, effectively. And so, yeah, it's often the caregiver or the family member that's having to speak up and try to provide that feedback and those answers. So I, I sense your uh, I completely understand the frustration that you're that you're dealing with there, and I'm sure you're not the only one. Yeah, we hear it all the time. Yeah. Thank and you, Diane. One thing, yeah. He does this. He has this constantly. He's seeing things on the floor, and he tried to bend over to pick them up. There's nothing on the floor, and that causes a lot of his falls. And his brain is really seeing it. So just kind of what we were talking about today is, you know, when your, your eyes play tricks on you and you see things that aren't there and then all of a sudden you might blink and your vision clears, imagine that that didn't go away for you. Imagine that you, your brain was telling you that there were objects on the floor or bugs on the wall. And it doesn't, it, as caregivers and family members, we often want to say, there's nothing there, don't worry. You know, there, there's nothing there that's going to harm you. But the real, the fact of the matter is, is that their brain is telling them that it's there. So sometimes what helps and what we advise is if you can break that perception or you can help them because if, if they're hallucinating and they are seeing bugs on the wall. So for example, there was a, um, back, back some time ago, I was working with some frontline care providers and there was a woman with dementia and she didn't want to get into her wheelchair because she told the care staff that there was a snake in her chair. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, that would cause distress, oh. an enormous amount of distress. So the care provider was so smart that he thought of, I'm going to, we're going to take this chair out of this room and we will get rid of this. And he brought in a different wheelchair afterward. He waited a little while for her to kind of calm down and feel more comfortable in that environment before he brought in another wheelchair. And oh. it cut that, it cut that hallucination and that perception so that she was able to then sit in the wheelchair. So it's, it doesn't help to tell the person you don't see it. It's not there. It's better to say, Oh, let, you know what, if that's bothering you, let's, let's leave, let's go to a different environment. If you can't remove the actual thing that's causing the hallucination, if you can take them to a safer environment or to say, let's, I'm going to call the care staff to have them vacuum that up and let's you and I go have a cup of tea in the sunroom. 
you know, and then when they're kind of going through that familiar conversation with you, they've calmed down. Often when they come back into that environment, that trigger for that hallucination may be gone. So I'm not sure if that helps, Diane. I know it's, I know it's tricky um, because they really do see those things. And you can always ask them. You can always say, what is it that you're experiencing? What is it that you're seeing? Can I help you? And, and um, I have a wonderful coworker and she tells this story in long-term care uh, when there was a lady that would see chicks, little baby chicks coming out of out of the vents in her room and she wasn't particularly distressed by it but she was annoyed by it she didn't want these little chicks in her space taking up her room and so she said to her one day how can i help what can i do and she's like well vacuum them up vacuum them up so they ended up bringing in a big the custodial staff brought in a big shop vac and she's like you tell me where they are and i'll vacuum them up and she went around the room vacuuming them up and this got to be kind of a pattern for this particular woman. So the family bought her her own shop vac. And every day at two o'clock in the afternoon, you'd hear the shop vac fire up and she'd be in there vacuuming up her chicks. So it helped. And then eventually that phase did pass for her because, you know, the brain changes continue to happen and that hallucination may not continue for long. But it's, it's finding ways to try to help that person gain that reassurance and safe, feeling of safety back. So it could be whatever, you know, asking the staff to, to bring the vacuum in if he's worried about things that are on the floor. Sarah, could I ask? Yeah, you? Kathleen. Um, like, uh, at the beginning when Albert started hallucinating, I used to say, no, 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 it's not. It's just your mind playing tricks on you and so on. Then I decided, you know what? I'm going to disagree with him. So the last time I was at the nursing home, he said, I got to go. I said, but you got to go. I got to go and claim the goal. I've got to go. Be Somebody's going to take it. And I said, oh, gosh, don't worry about that. I went already and I took it. Well, why didn't you tell me? I said, oh, I forgot to tell you. Well, what did you do with it? I said, I went and I put it in the bank. I said, oh, oh, good, good. I said, Albert, you know I've been taking care of everything for you for all these years. You think I would let somebody take it? He says, I took care of that. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, so, Kathy, <laughs> such a good approach. Because you provided that reassurance, too. And, and hallucinations can happen when a person is feeling anxious. Yes. Right? When they're worried about something. So if you can take that worry away and let them know that you're dealing with the situation. Right. Um, because again, their brain is telling them that it's true and we yeah. can't fight that delusion yeah. or hallucination. Um, their reality is their reality. So yeah. if we can help to provide that reassurance or to make them feel calm, that yeah. is your best approach yeah. every time. Yeah. And then you said that, she said, Good job. Every time you, come here, you calm him down so nicely because I just said, no, I took care of that. Oh, I did that. Oh, no, no. no. And you know what I noticed he does too? He takes stuff out of the air and he's eating it. Yeah. Yes. What is, what is yes. he seeing? Why does that too? Very common. They see things in the air. They and we don't know what it could be. Again, you can ask them. Say, what are you eating? What do you see in the air? It's okay. It's okay to explore that reality. Maybe he's picking something from a tree. You never know. Could be. They it's had true. Cherry, they had cherry trees. Or he puts you know, it in I your hand and there's nothing Are you really there. just trying to ignore it? Yeah. So um. Just I'm you know. Asking. The, the the best strategy I always say is to meet them where they're at. Yeah. You no, know, explore their yeah. reality with them and meet them where they're at. Instead of saying no, 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 that's not happening. Just you can ask them, well, what what are you what are you eating there? Yeah. And let them explain to you what it is. I could even say, could I have one? <laughs> 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 and Thank you, ladies, for sharing that. That was great, Kathleen. That's like a very good example. One more quick question. Sure. Aunt has dementia. And um, when you look at her, her eyes are glazed. Like, like if it's not her. What makes, what, hap what happens there? Yeah. So oftentimes when a person does progress, usually we don't see 
we often refer to the, as as a vacant expression. It Does is. that kind of match what you're yeah. saying? So yeah. we don't usually see that vacant expression until a little later on in the disease process. The person again is not necessarily connecting with um, what it is you're saying or asking them to do. They may be experiencing a hallucination. They may be even daydreaming. They may be thinking about something that's unrelated. And also because they're not always able, they're, with the brain changes, they're not always able to control their, their facial expression. So they do okay. to take on a very vacant expression, a very flat, sometimes it's called a flat expression. Yeah, yeah. Um, but her face and, is like that all the time now. Ah, and yeah. it's not, it's not always easy for them to, so, so they may, they may laugh, but they may not be able to make their facial expressions look yeah. joyful. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And it's, it's a, it's a hard thing because again, it's the brain to the body part. It's that mm -hmm. message that gets lost somewhere in the translation. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately they, they may stare off into space and you may think that they're not listening. Um, mm -hmm. And it could be because they're thinking about something else or they may surprise you when they are listening. But it's like what Shelby said, having that ability to direct their gaze to yeah. the, the appropriate stimuli. It may be um, kind of will be impacted by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's another great question. Any other questions or, or comments about our session today? I, uh, I wanted to let you know um, that Shelby and I are working on some more education for the fall. So we're in the early planning stages. There's lots happening, um, as you can well imagine, with businesses and things reopening. And so we've got a lot, a lot to consider as a society, but we... Shelby and I have agreed that we want to continue to provide uh, that online virtual education. And so we don't know exactly dates and things. So we want you to stay tuned for the details. We'll reach out to you with that information. It may come through your client support coordinators that, or it may come through us. Um, and we'll let you know what we've got coming up. And hopefully the topics are of interest to you. And, and that being said, we really encourage you to reach out to us if there's particular topics or, you know, information that you want to learn about that would be helpful for you. Um, chances are very good it's going to be helpful for others too. So don't be shy to reach out to us um, and share with us what it is you want to learn because that's how we want to shape the education to meet your needs. It's cool in here, so. any, and any other thoughts, Shelby, that, that you want to share? that I might have missed. I just want to thank everyone for attending today and for their commitment throughout. And um, I think we just hope that today's presentation um, helps you to maybe see the environment in a different way that the person with dementia is moving through and maybe shed some light on some possible, you know, barriers that they may be facing and may not necessarily be able to communicate to you. Um, but just to see how an environment that looks normal to us may be quite complicated for them. So hopefully we kind of got that angle a, a, across and um, kind of gave you some new things to think about in supporting the person. Thanks, Shelby. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes, Thank I you. echo. I echo what Shelby said. We're we're so grateful for for your support and your attendance at these sessions. So um, yeah, we hope today's information was helpful for you. It was great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank okay. you. So as always, we'll have this recording available on our YouTube channel and on our website. So um, if somebody, if you know that somebody couldn't make it today, please let them know um, that it will be made available to watch at another time. So. Okay. Thanks, Sarah and Shelby. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Have a wonderful day. You too. Take good care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.